Hello again. In this lesson, we're going to talk about inverse functions. Now, the idea of inverse functions is something you've probably already done and worked with. You just maybe don't know that that's what they're called. We're going to look at some of the ones that you probably have seen already, and then we're going to discuss in general how inverse functions are created and what they are used for. So here's an example of a situation where you would need an inverse function. I am asking you to solve for x. Now the equation is x squared is equal to 5, and none of the regular basic mathematical operations can be used here to isolate x. Um, a power of 2 is not gotten rid of with a plus minus times or division. You need an actual other type of function to destroy the square. And we know that that type of function is a square root. So now you could probably figure out how to do this on your calculator very easily, but I am going to show the steps so you start to understand how an inverse function behaves with a function. What you do is you envelop the original function with its inverse. So the square root here is completely enveloping the x squared. And what you do on one side of the equation, you immediately do on the other side of the equation. And at that point, you have probably been taught that a square root of an x squared just gives you an x. And what we have done is we have pulled out the x from the x squared by destroying the x squared with the root. You'll notice that the root and the x squared are gone now because they've completely annihilated each other. On this side, we would just use a calculator now to actually find the answer. And that in a nutshell is basically what an inverse function is. It's a function that completely annihilates another function and pulls out the variable that's stuck inside. That variable is often called the argument. So that's probably the most used inverse function up until this point. But there are others that you have used. And if you've taken any trigonometric um, or trigonometry classes at this point, this is a situation where you also need an inverse function. So it says solve for the angle. We have sine theta is equal to 0.5. Well, the sine here is not multiplying theta, even though it is right beside it. It has enveloped theta similarly to how the x squared had enveloped the x at the beginning of the first example. We need something that will destroy that sign. And you should have learned that there is a symbol on your calculator, which is an inverse function. This is the symbol here. It is actually called the arc sign. So we are going to arc sign both sides of this equation. Once again, I'm going to show the long process of doing this. So you would arc sign this side. And again, the arc sign is enveloping the sine theta. And you are going to arc sign this side as well to keep the equation balanced. On the left hand side here, the arc sign destroys the sign, pulls out the argument. The argument in this case is the theta that is trapped inside the sign. All you are left with on that side is the theta. And on this side, if you arc signed this on a calculator, you'd end up with your answer of 30 degrees. Arc cos and arc tan are also inverse functions. Their jobs are to get rid of the cos and the tan to be able to isolate a variable that's stuck inside them. And that brings me to the sentence here at the bottom of the slide. The role of an inverse function is to destroy another function and pull out the argument. So anytime you're working with something that is affecting x other than a plus minus dividing or multiplication scenario, if you have to isolate that variable, you're going to need an inverse function to do that. So how do we actually go about creating inverse functions? Well, the process is strange. Here's the example. I'm going to go back to the 
x squared idea, okay? So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna create an inverse function the way that mathematicians would have done it. It's something that you don't do anywhere else in math. We are literally going to switch the positions of the x and the y variable in the equation. So the x is going to take the place of the y, the y is going to take the place of the x. In no other place in mathematics is this allowed to be done. The only place that you're allowed to do that is if you're looking for an inverse function. Once you've done that, you re-isolate the y value. And in a case like this, you would then as a mathematician have to create a symbol to represent how are we going to destroy the squared that's affecting the y in order to get our x all by itself. And the process to do that is with a square root. So we would square root x, we would square root the y squared, and our final answer would be y is equal to root x, and we have now created an inverse function. So that's basically the process. It's a very strange process. Nowhere else in math would you ever switch the x and y positions like that, but that is the process for getting an inverse function. If we graph these two relationships now, our original function was y is equal to x squared. Our new function is y is equal to root x. And if we look at both the positive and negative values of that root function, you basically get a graph that looks like this. Now, even though this graph looks like it has just been turned, that is not the way that we actually talk about how these graphs behave. The way that we talk about how these graphs behave is that they have been reflected and the axis over which they have been reflected is the y is equal to x axis. You're switching the x and y positions. A 1, 1 will stay a 1, 1. But a 2, 4 becomes a 4, 2. And that is basically the same thing as reflecting it along the y is equal to x graph, which should make sense because we're switching the y and x positions. So the y becomes an x and the x becomes a y. So if we were to graph that, it gives us this y is equal to x graph. So any inverse function is graphed as a reflection along that line. You can do inverse functions in a table of values as well as with an equation. So let's take the table of values of uh, a function. We're gonna take the x values. So this is a parent function that we've dealt with before. So we're gonna take some x values that we know work very well with this particular parent function. We're gonna, oops generate the y values that go with it. In order to get the inverse function, we are going to flip the x and y positions. Now, because this is still gonna be an x, the way I'm gonna write this now is by writing a y inverse to show that this has now changed into a different function. But we're gonna take all of the x values and make them become the y values here and we're gonna take all of the y values and make them become the x values here. So you're still switching the x and y's positions. This is creating an inverse y function. Let's look at another algebraic example. How would you find the inverse function of the following formula? y is equal to 1 over x. We're going to switch the x and y positions. We get x is equal to 1 over y. 
and then we re-isolate for y. To re-isolate for y here, we're going to multiply both sides by y, and then we need to move the x out of there, so we're gonna divide by x, and if you remember how this worked in trigonometry, you're basically just exchanging the x and the y positions by using some algebra here. And an interesting phenomenon in this one is that your inverse function is actually the exact same as your function. And that should actually make sense if you consider what the graph of a one over x relationship looks like. If we talk about the reflection along the y is equal to x axis again, well, in this case, your reflection is gonna actually give you the exact same values. So, for instance, if you take a point here and reflect it, it ends up being here. Therefore, there is no change to the look of the graph. If you take a point here, reflect it, it'll appear here. Again, no change to the graph. So it is possible for certain functions to actually be the inverses of themselves. Now, this requires me to have a, a small little discussion as to what are the symbols that they use for inverse functions. And I'm actually not a big fan of the symbol that they've chosen. And I'll talk about why. The general inverse function symbol is f negative one of x. Now here's why I don't like this, and I've actually seen this be an issue with trigonometry uh, when we're teaching arc sine, arc cos, and arc tan. Students start to think that that negative one is an exponent, and this is not an exponent. My preference would actually be to write this as f inverse of x, so that students wouldn't think that it was an exponent. But unfortunately, that is not the standard around the world. The negative one symbol is the symbol that is used. This can't be considered an exponent because it is not enveloping the f of x. It is right, ne to, right next to the f before the x. And that is supposed to be your hint as to the fact that this is not an exponent. So for instance, if I wrote these two next to each other, they are not equal to each other. As soon as the negative one is taken to the outside of the function, this particular one would be one over f of x because that here is an exponent. It's affecting the entire function, but here, the symbol is telling you that this is the inverse of the function f of x, in which case you'd have to switch the x and the y positions and do the work that I just showed on the previous slide. You'll have to get used to that. And that is why the arc sine symbol, sine negative one, is not one over sine, because that actually doesn't make any sense. A function can't exist on its own without a symbol beside it. So you absolutely have to have the argument either inside or next to it like this. These do not equal each other. Sine negative one is not one over sine. It is not an exponent. It is the inverse function. So again, something you're gonna have to get used to, but with usage, hopefully that this will become um, second nature to you and you won't have any trouble with that. That's gonna be the end of the inverse function introductory lesson we will have other lessons about this topic.